Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast, is brought to you by, well, you. If you want to learn how to support our show, go to patreon.com slash laststandmedia. Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to Sacred Symbols Plus, a PlayStation podcast supplement. This is episode number unknown, but this is the Dead Space remake review discussion and spoiler cast. We're a little late in bringing this to you, no doubt, but uh, just had some scheduling snafus and obviously the live show in Houston threw us off. We had also Sacred Symbols Plus nine episodes in a, nine of 18 episodes will have been about the last of us on HBO. So we just lost a lot of territory. In fact, the Sacred League had to be put on hiatus because we couldn't even fit that in there. But uh, we're getting this finally out, this wonderful game, Dead Space Remake. I'm joined by a very interesting group of people indeed. Let's start with Dustin Furman, executive producer. How are you today, my friend? I never start with you, ever. Oh, well, I'm not ready. I'm not prepared. But actually, no, I'm fine. I'm doing doing okay. I've been, um, Chris, I want to ask you about this and maybe, you know, I'm curious how you're doing because you were sick before the show and after. When I got home that week, I was like, eh, I'm like... 30 percent sick not enough to yeah, not do yeah. anything but enough to be annoyed and then the weekend came i was like oh i'm on the upswing i'm doing i think i'm doing all right monday and today I'm like nope i'm just like i don't know like this yeah, little yeah. bit of achiness a little bit of some i did a covid test just out of curiosity i didn't think it was covid not that so i don't know some kind of general houston funk following me yeah. home i guess that's that was my exact experience where like I was like sick and then I would thought it was kind of on the mend and then I just got decimated for like a hot mm. minute. And I'm, I don't know. I'm still like congested still, but I feel like 100 percent fine. It's weird. Like, I don't I don't know what the hell is going on. There's there's something mm. like, you know what it is? It's probably all that fucking nitric acid and and all the weird oil, like uh, poisonous clouds spilling out of trains and <laughs> random from all these derailments right? all over. Yeah, Things keep dude, happening. Dude, I, I honestly like. I, look, man, I'm no meteorologist or scientist or fucking virologist or nothing. But like, it's it's weird that all that shit happened. That it started <laughs> hailing and snowing in California for like out of nowhere. It, it's it's weird. Shit, dude, I was, I was reading something bizarre. about the snow in California in the mountains where there was like ten feet of snow, literally ten feet of snow. And, and it's ridiculous. And I were talking about that. Yeah, 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 we were talking about that yesterday. San and that's in the, that's a, that's like in Southern California in the mountains where that shit usually happens in Sierra Nevada. Which yeah is a nightmare in and of itself, but dude, really, really pretty. Dude, it was it was snowing in, Bur- like on the street, in Burbank. And That's I was like, insane. And I was like, this is ridiculous. That's and it was hail- it was ha- it was hailing. One of these other days, it's just like it's less- Dr. Wiley's weather machine, weather control machine gone amok. <laughs> yeah, Do- it's, all a Mega joke. Matt. it's Dr. L- this, this is the, the voice I always use for for Dr. Light when I make fun of him. The the <laughs> Micah for some reason she finds it funny where it's like Mega Man. I created Weather Man. To help predict the weather formations, but Doctor Wiley reprogrammed him. It's like that's the thing that happens to like 150 different robots. Like, can we stop? Yeah, <laughs> nope. Yeah, maybe like, how many? With, making them. You're making these really effective murdering machines that are very easy to reprogram. I don't know how you don't understand that by this point. <laughs> how you haven't had anyway. That was Chris Reagan. Chris, good to hear from you, my friend. Good to see you. Glad you're well. Mm-hmm. Dagan Moriarty, my brother. How are you today, my brother? My brother. Where where even am I right now? I mean, this isn't too weird. This could be a consolation episode, right? But we're mm-hmm. far we're we're far away from knockback right now. You were making me laugh, Carl, because you were saying you were sort of apologizing to the audience about how late you are. This is the earliest I've talked about a game by far my entire <laughs> life. We did the initial Dead Space for knockback in 2020. <laughs> yeah, it was at the turn of the year. I remember in those lofty pre-COVID days. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, no, you're you're right. And it's a far cry really from the way I used to cover games too, where we would have spoiler casts and review discussions up but before often the game even came out or when the game came out. And it's kind of nice being out of that mix because first of all, I don't know how that's useful to anyone, but also it's just a, such a pinch, you know, to have to play games like that. And so we're doing Dead Space Remake today. It did come out. When did Dead Space Remake come out? I don't even remember anymore. January, Let me look. Right? I'm Late looking January? At it. January 27th. Yeah. It came out. And uh, so, yeah, we're recording this in the at the end of the first week of March. And unfortunately, it's not as fresh in my mind as it was when I played it, but I'm still ready to go. I have extensive notes. I think we all have a lot to say about this game. I actually got the platinum trophy in it. I beat it three times. And uh, it's 
extraordinary. And I'm really, really excited to, to get into what you guys think about it. So, um, Chris, I want to start with you. I know you were really high on this game. Like I am. I'm a big fan of the original. I've argued that the best survival horror game of all time is potentially Resident Evil 4, but more likely the original Dead Space. So I was very excited to play this. And it's so funny. We're going to get two, no doubt, stunning remakes of these two games within two months of each other, which is yeah incredible. I can't That's wait for nuts. Resident Evil 4 to come out. It's just been years since I played it and it needs all that help. I think Dead Space needed less help because Dead Space is from a generation after Resident Evil 4. But uh, nonetheless, I, I went into Dead Space remake with a lot of hype and a lot of excitement because I really love the first one. And what I found personally was something extraordinary. I mean, this is an amazing, amazing execution. We talk about production for Square Inch usually in terms of first person or first party games, but there's a lot of that here, too. And uh, I'm really eager to hear kind of your high level thoughts on Dead Space remake. No, yeah, 100%. I, uh, I remember I remember really, really liking the original Dead Space, but um, there were parts of the original Dead Space that kind of marred the experience. So there, there are definitely parts of that game that didn't age as well as uh, other parts of it. I think, I think generally the exploration was, was really cool, and I, th- I thought the combat was still pretty solid, and then the atmosphere was really great. Um, but then you had, like, you know, zero gravity sections and, and kind of you know, really tenuous combat rooms and arenas that just didn't feel as, as fluid as maybe they wanted them to. And, and, and despite those, I mean, there's a turret section that is like the worst part of the original <laughs> Dead Space. And I remember hating it. And I, and I remember finishing the original Dead Space thinking like, that was mostly amazing. Um, and, you know, I, I remember just kind of filing away. as like, this is something to remember for sure. And so when the remake was announced, I was like, oh man, I wonder... I mean, the big question is to is is about this game before it came out or before like I really paid much attention to it was how they were going to treat this as far as remake and remasters go because it's not exactly like a Shadow of the Colossus like kind of up res kind of retexturing and it's not exactly it's not exactly like this this earth shattering transformative thing like um, Final Fantasy VII remake. You know, it's, it's it's somewhere in the middle where there's a lot that they do to kind of uplift the design of the original game. It's not a one-to-one, but it's also what I remember in some way. Like it's, it's how I remember the original game playing. I actually had to go back and look at some gameplay footage of the original and being like, Oh, this is not how this was, but it's so good in the remake that it just tricks you into thinking. And those parts in the original game that were, that were originally like the sore spots in this version are now like the highlights for me. Like I love the zero gravity sections in this. I love like the turret section was so cool. Uh, the, that there, there are boss fights in here that I remember being like remarkably tedious that now thanks to the, you know, the developments that we've made in, in 3d control and just like the things that, you know, a lot of developers have learned about, you know, moving through 3d space are just like a lot more satisfying and a lot more fun. They've, they added some mechanics in from dead space two to kind of like really flesh out the environment and the, and the combat of dead space one that makes the combat feel a lot more visceral and, and, and it feels a lot more, and you feel, you feel a lot more aggressive in this because you feel a little bit more capable, but it never lets up on that. And I was talking about this on, on one of the original or on uh, one of the um, sacred symbols episode we did where I feel like it's one of I feel like of any survival horror game that I've ever played, Dead Space, particularly the remake, does the best job I've ever seen of balancing the feeling of power with with that still really ever present feeling of survival horror. Whereas like Resident Evil 4, I mean, we just talked about it a little bit, is amazing, but it's not particularly scary. In in my opinion, it's 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 like a, it's a very like it's more like an eerie kind of game. It's like it's it's eerie. It's kind of dreary. It's it, there's like some dreadfulness in it, but there's a lot of like comedy in it, too. It's it's like very and there's it's a lot of action in it. Um, Resident Evil 5, even more so <laughs> with punching boulders into lava, lava streams. But this huh. game, like no matter how strong you get, you still feel like it's it's claustrophobic and it's and it's scary and it's. There are things that get you still like all the way to the very end. And I, I, I love it. I think um, it's like the definitive like version of Dead. So like I don't like somebody was asking me, it's like, would you would you recommend going to like the remake first or or would you re- recommend playing the original? It's like the, re- the the original is completely obsolete, in my opinion. Like 100 percent. I didn't think that was necessarily possible. I thought that was that was going to be a big 
task for them to do, but I, I think they did it. I, I think Dead Space Remake is borderline phenomenal. Yeah, well said. I agree. 100%. Very well said. Uh, Dave, let's go to you. I'm curious to hear what you think. You played the original Dead Space in late 2019, early 2020. That was the last time I played it as well. Yeah. But that was not my first time playing it. Um, I'm curious what we really heaped a lot of praise on it on that episode of Knockback. People can go back and listen to that if they'd like. But I'm curious uh, what you made of this new one, especially, you know, it's PlayStation 5, very slick, two generations ahead. As uh, Chris mentioned, it's just um, the game just feels a lot better than the original, no doubt. And I was reading a little bit about the original Dead Space where it's on some proprietary EA engine. It's like not even on a named engine as far as I can tell. It's on oh, they, wow. it's on an engine that like they made to make that that game The Godfather, if you remember. Oh wow. Remember and that uh, game. which is pretty interesting and so it was moved to Frostbite obviously for this and you can tell. I mean it's just a much much more proper engine, but I'm curious what you what you make of Dead Space from a a high level Dead Space remake specifically. Yeah, we talked. I think that was episode ninety nine of Knockback. So many moons ago, I loved revisiting it. I, I, I mean, Chris summed it up really well. I mean, it is a game that's kind of a strange anomaly. It's very faithful to the original, but it's super plussed at the same time. It's kind of a rare breed in that way. It's evolved smoothly for twenty twenty three. You know, graphically, orally, of course, the gameplay. I think we're also far enough out from the original where it's like kind of the perfect timing because you imagine the original like yeah that was just a wonderful game how how much justice can they possibly do it and then you play it and like and you're like oh shit yeah this this got a lot better which is interesting because the memory fades a little bit i mean i'll say this for the game too just for dead space from my perspective as a whole i haven't played two or three so i have some gaps it's also strange for me because i'm usually pretty quick on the draw but the story, the more I read into the story and the characters and the lore and the origins and everything like that, and of course, I have some gaps with not playing the second too, but I am utterly confused by a lot of it. And I realize like I kind of come from that 80s kid perspective, like give me the sci-fi horror, give me the colonial marine hunting xenomorph thing. Like that's what I love about, that's really what I love about this whole uh, experience, especially with the remake. And um, in fact, I'm looking forward to maybe learning a little bit from you guys about things that I'm just confused about. But yeah, from I'll, a I'll, gameplay perspective, I mean, I had a absolute ball with this. I'm glad to hear that, first of all. And I'll, I'll run down the story for you. It's kind of like when Dagan and I did Bioshock on uh, Knockback. And then I'm like, so we were talking about the audio diaries, which if you don't read, listen to the audio diaries, there is oh, no yeah. story of Bioshock. And Dagan's like, oh, I didn't listen to those. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> kind of guilty of this doing this again. What? Actually. <laughs> yeah, I think you got to kind of recalibrate your mind if you want to understand things. You have to get into the into the collectibles and into the you're not really in that modern mode. I mean, it's not so modern anymore. I would say that this began in the PS2 era at the earliest, sure. maybe the PS3 sure. era at the latest. But um, yeah, you got to recalibrate your mind because that might be why you're confused. Although I think the, the story is a little confusing and I'll, I'll explain everything once we hear from Dustin about his high level thoughts then i will uh, i'll give a little synopsis and we'll uh, and we'll go from there all right so dustin let's hear from you about your thoughts on dead space remake what is your experience with the original yeah you're but a you're but a young boy like chris um you weren't you know you were in your you, you were in middle school or high school when the original you were in high school what, high school what year was it 2008 was it 2008 yeah so either eighth grade or ninth grade i think when this mm -hmm. came out so yeah i actually have a, a really different experience than everyone else here because I never finished the original. I remember getting it, but at the time it wasn't really the type of game I was into. I had much more of a narrow focus of what I liked at that time. I remember not really being into it, but not thinking it was bad. I was also kind of a wimp where a lot of horror games freaked me out back then. So I, I wasn't really feeling it, but I always knew as I grew older and my and my tastes evolved, that this is one that I eventually wanted to go back to at some point. And so, of course, when the remake was announced, I knew this was something I, I wanted to check out. So. The thing for me just to to shout out on a high level is the the visual fidelity of this game, particularly on on console. I'm sure it's pretty much similar on PlayStation 5 or, or Xbox. It's just that this game looks so good, particularly the. Um, I, oh, and I brought up the term to make sure I got it right. The volsymetric lighting 
which is when you have light that you can kind of see like the particles and see if there's like some fog in the air. There's like so, yeah. the lighting in this game. It's amazing. Is is amazing. And it really does add to this overall sense of presence. And the thing that overall, when I was playing through it, Colin, you brought up Bioshock. And I feel like while I think Resident Evil 4 is the main comparison that people bring up, I think from a story and maybe not story, but in the way it tells the story in a, in a feeling perspective that Bioshock is such a apt comparison and just that the environment is as important to the story and is almost a character in itself to what's going on in the Ishimura, almost like Rapture is. And the other element is just in how, sure, there's lots of plot points and things that happen while you play the game, but the core of the story actually happened before you even arrive. Mm -hmm. And it's this chipping away at figuring out little details here and there and kind of building this more complete picture of what happened. I feel like it's weird. I was trying to think when you guys were talking, I was like, is this kind of like something of that era that I don't know if people have really maximized on since then or done something really like we think of Bioshock, we think of this and some others, but like some of them, I feel like can get some aspects, right? Maybe that you have like audio logs and some backstory, but this game, I think also suffers that I, there's parts where there's a lot of reading, which people know in yeah. any spoiler cast. I, I would much rather have an audio log all, like any time, which I understand that some things wouldn't make sense to be an audio log, but I don't know. So, so some of the reading, I don't want to give it too harsh of a criticism in this game because I think it, it makes sense, but that's just purely a preference thing from, from my side. But overall, I, I really, really was into this game. I love the way to, from just from a gameplay perspective, just how, it really balanced out the weapons and balanced out how it fed you ammo. So it was constantly having you recycle and try out new things and, and try to get the upgrades. And I just, uh, I had a great time and I'm very curious about what they do with the success of this game now. Yeah. I'm, um, I'm interested in this too, because uh, it's hard to, the the first game is very similar. Well, the first game and this game are, are pretty identical, but and it's as Chris was saying, this is some space in between. For instance, there are different layouts inside the ship, different places you're supposed to go. It's there are side quests and things that were not in the original game at all. So there is like a pretty interesting um, there is a, a pretty interesting conversation to be had about that. And then, of course, I wanted to really touch on Dustin, something you brought up, which was Bioshock. I think it's uh, Bioshock and Dead Space are complete analogs to each other. And Bioshock is a year earlier than Dead Space, but Dead Space. So Dead Space couldn't have possibly been influenced by um, Bioshock in any meaningful way. It's just not possible compared to how quickly they would have been had to have implement those changes. But it is the whole idea of stalking a a limited location over and over again. And, And I would say that Dead Space is scarier than Bioshock because Bioshock has places for you to like hide like you could conceive and people do live in rapture for years and don't turn into splicers and figure things out. It's not many of them, but that kind of stuff happens here. I I imagine you won't last long. What's interesting about this game is that it feels like and really does take place in real time. Yeah, about how much time you'd expect all this to happen and, and and how much time you'd have to figure this shit out. And that's what's really cool about it. And so, yeah, that that feeling of um of urgency is there as well. And I, I did want to touch base. Uh, you were talking about lighting. I have to agree. And I think it's probably aided by our very expensive OLED screens that we play on these days. Yeah. But, but, um, oh, yeah, hundred percent, but the blacks are so black, you know, and Inky. it's amazing. Like it's amazing how the TV looks like it's off almost sometimes like that. You're, you're falling into some sort of blackness as opposed to seeing the reflective blackness of the old days. It's it's hard for me to describe, but I I noticed it more in this game than any other that I've played, probably because this is the first PS5 survival horror game of a really high quality that I've played, apart from, I guess, Callisto Protocol, which tried. All right, so what is this about? I think some of, you need some, you need to pull some of this, I think, from like some of the smaller details from the, from the other games, but this is basically, and I never even played the third game and I never beat the second one. Um, I wasn't crazy about it, actually. I feel like, that space should have just been like, like many games should have just a been one-off. a one-off. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, 
they can't leave anything alone. And I understand that. I mean, the game did very well. But what it's basically about is, uh, and you guys can f- fill in or jump in at, at how you want, is the game takes place in the 2500s. And Earth is in a situation, a very futuristic situation where we're, we're traveling around different systems and using these really sophisticated um, spaceships and all of the rest. But we're in need of um resources earth is just totally stripped of resources nothing left and there's a unified government on earth which is called colloquially earth gov and you you figure that out later because there's actually someone working for earth gov um kendra that is basically with you most of the most of the adventure and she's working on their behalf so what ends up happening is so that's one piece of it the another piece of it is that in Chicksel Club, Club Crater or whatever you call it, the one where the the one in the Yucatan Peninsula where the dinosaurs, that's the one that killed the dinosaurs, the comet or the asteroid. They find a marker, what they call a marker. And they realize this thing is made, it's red. And um, it's made of an unknown substance. And it has this like electromagnetic power, but it also fucks people up when they get too close to it. And it's unclear if it arrived in this in this kind of um, spatial situation or if it was brought here or whatever. It, I mean, I think it being found in a crater indicates that it crash landed here at some point. But no one understands anything about it. No one can control it. And um, in order to try to study it, the humans do a Roswell type. We're going to try to build this thing again. So they use bismuth, which is a real substance because they can't use the, the substance that's used in. Um, in other part, you know, in, in in this, they don't know where the substance even is found. That's that the, the mm-hmm. thing is made out of, and they create it, and they kind of bastardize it in some way, and it creates this. Uh, it starts like corrupting people, and psychologically, and mutating people, as you see with the necromorphs and all of the rest, which is actually another Bioshock like parallel with the splicers and yeah. being addicted yeah. to all that stuff. So it's pretty cool. And then Colin, can I add a detail real yeah, quick? Yeah, it adds please. a lot of flavor to this is that because I just learned this today. I was watching like some of the lore recaps and stuff like that just to refresh myself since it's been a while. That marker was found in the year 2214. Right. So this is almost like think about it from our perspective of if there was an ain't a religion founded around something that happened, a cover up that happened 300 years prior to now. So I don't know. That added a lot to me to think about these people like, oh, there was this weird stuff going on and there's this conspiracy cover up. And 300 years later, there's still followers creating this Scientology type uh, religion, which is about what you were going to get to. Right. So the, 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 the religion is unitology in the game. And this is important because and I'm not sure you learn this in this game, but you learn later on. I, you might learn it in a note or something that basically this thing was discovered in this crater and kept secret from everyone. And it was fucking everything up around it. And there was like a whistleblower that was like, oh, shit, like everyone needs to know about this. And he gets it out and he becomes like the Jesus Christ like figure of unitology. And what the people in unitology think once they learn that there's this alien unknown thing on Earth is that like they need to worship it and figure it out and that it could even be a source of like in, in um, limitless electrical power and all these different theories that they have for it. Um. But what ends up happening is that to try to hide it, I guess, they, you know, around that time, so hundreds of years prior, they bury it on some random planet to get it off the planet and to get it all like away from Earth. And that planet happens to be ages seven. They don't tell anyone about it. So hundreds of years later, these miners go to ages seven and they find it, but they weren't supposed to find it. They're, They're finding this buried thing that they were hoping would be lost and it was only lost for a few hundred years. So I think that's basically like everything you need to know about it. So there's a real pillar and like a, a marker and a fake marker. And they want to, the real marker and the fake, like the, the fake marker is this replication and they want to get the real marker back to the planet. Um, and it was during this mining operation that everyone on the planet, which you learn late in the game, had gone crazy. I think that's basically the synopsis of that the story. Fair. I could be yeah. wrong. Um, no, and then there's right. obviously characters in like a more micro story with Isaac Clark. Right. But I think that's it. So, Dig, I wanted to go to you first. I was curious what you, we always, we just brought up recently had the power of religion and fiction. And this is one of my favorite parts of it, especially if you get the secret ending um, for the new game plus, which we can discuss later, which I got. But um, 
I'm curious what you think about the the story now and, and what you, what you already understood about it, and I guess maybe what you understand about it now. What do you think about that setup? Yeah, those high level thoughts um, were known to me, and you know, I, I I love it because this game has so much. Right, it's fun to play. But you, of course, you have the action, you have the sci-fi horror, you have the Cronenberg-esque body horror elements, and you have the whole classic humanity versus evil alien thing. And like aliens, like the alien franchise had, you know, the vile corporation emphasizing profit over human life. This is kind of the same model, but it's like the vile cult emphasizing religious zealotry over human life, you know, type of thing. And what I love, you have all of that bedrock, but then you have this rich story on top of it that makes everything even more textured, deeper, more interesting. And then as you said, college, you already intimated, like it has some personal substance and beef to it too, because the character, our protagonist has some personal, you know, he has some personal, uh, he's personally invested in the story because we find out he lost his parents through this fanatical religion. And of course there's something, you know, his uh, wife is involved. So it's, it it gets us even deeper. I'm not even sure something this amazing, you know, you could keep it surface level or you can make it this deep and enrich it with story and substance. Like some of the best game makers do like, Talk about Druckmann, talk about Kojima, you know, all those guys. So it's nice that this game works on both fronts. You know, it's something for everybody. I think it, there's so much story and there are so many characters and so much backstory that it does get actually confusing. You know, the other thing is, too, that I was – we got so wrapped up with Houston, I think. Everybody got so busy. We were supposed to cover this a little quicker. My Also, mm-hmm. my question is to you guys, why can't you just lie? It's like – when you send a check late and you, you feel a little better by like, you know, writing like a week, two weeks yeah, ago yeah, on the check. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> we actually recorded this then, but we just had to put it up now type of thing. But I, I, I had to play it within a week. So I had kind of like that flop sweat. Am I going to get this done? And, you know, I'm notoriously slow anyway. But it's nice that the game works on both levels. It's very arcadey and fun. And then also you could you could go deeper with the lore and get as invested as you want. Chris, what are your thoughts on kind of the setup? I mean, it's not vital to the beat to beat gameplay. I don't think you even need to know any of this to really enjoy or understand the game on a on a um, in an isolated basis. But I do love the the greater sci fi story and and also like the government fuckery and it's it's actually like <laughs> it's it's geo it's actually reminds me quite a bit of Alien in that it's some mixture of government corporations and just a lot of dishonesty in a sci fi setting which for some reason really works. And then, and then adding this religious element to it just really heightens it for me. Yeah. It, it's, it's funny because when I was younger, I don't really, re- I, I don't remember the religious angle being there at all. And I guess I just wasn't really paying that much attention because the, the thing that was really absorbing about dead space to me was just the, the, the atmosphere and just going through it. And, and, and I, I think I gravitate towards the micro stories first before I, Before I start to delve into the, because like, I mean, there's so many macro stories in so many games, you know, like you'd probably benefit greatly from knowing all of them, but like, I only have so much bandwidth, you know, (laughs) and, and, you know, I got to choose the things that I get super, super deeply enveloped in. And honestly, like the, the broader story of Dead Space never really grabbed me. What grabbed me more was, was the premise of Isaac Clarke being this engineer kind of forced into this role of like, Hey, I know how to use these tools. I know how to retrofit these tools. I know how to, I know how to modify these tools that are built for, you know, repairing and, and welding and mining and all this stuff and repurpose them for combat in a, in a setting and story that made sense. I think that's the coolest part of dead space to me is the fact that you are, you're an engineer and yeah, you're using just equipment to mow down like legions of ungodly, like Cronenberg like creatures. And especially in the remake where they do like a great job of like, you know, there's a, there's a weapon where you peel back the skin of enemies and it's so damn satisfying. And then some of the and some of the enemies are wearing like the the Ishimura staff clothes, which I thought was like a nice touch because in the original they were all I, th- I think completely like just like naked creatures. Right. Um, and I thought the, the addition of that was like really cool. And- well, cause it, 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 it continues to suggest or at least beat the head, beat the audience over the head. Like these, this is the crew. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's, it's a nice touch. And I think it, it does a lot, 
But I don't know the story, the, the broader story never appealed to me as much because I, I, I see this mark. I see this big sci-fi MacGuffin and I'm like, OK, I get it. It's corrupting people. Cool. As long as the result of it is awesome and it is, I'm totally fine. But I think even back then, the story, the story of the original Dead Space was never like the, the big the big you know selling point i think it was it was always the atmosphere and how well it was done and i think the fact that they gave isaac a voice this time you know where he i mean he had it in dead space 2 and 3 those are games i'm not super familiar with but the fact that they added it into this game it it, that really could have gone wrong um it's real i mean we saw recently like (laughs) at least i saw recently with atomic heart how uh how just the writing of a, a primary protagonist or the main character can just completely ruin uh, uh, like an otherwise probably pretty solid game. And so I was thinking when this game was coming out, I was like, oh man, they gave Isaac a voice. I hope it, it's the same guy too from two and three, but I was still like, you know, I don't have any nostalgia for those games. So it's like, I don't know how this is going to work, but it ends up working really great. Like he doesn't, he doesn't really give the answers to any puzzles. He doesn't speak when it's, he only speaks when it's, I would argue, like narratively necessary. And the stuff that he says makes sense. It's in character. It makes it I guess it removes a bit of that. Um, it removes a bit of that kind of um, that old school, almost like Halo quality where like, you know, you are the main character and, you know, you don't talk during gameplay or whatever. But I mean, you're already playing Isaac Clark, who's looking for his girlfriend who you don't care about. So like <laughs> they might as well flesh him out as a character. And I think they did a great job with that too. But yeah, I don't know the unitology stuff. I will admit I didn't read everything. I listened to most of the audio logs, but I feel like I listened to them like in the wrong order or something. Cause like, I feel like I was learning things at incorrect times, <laughs> but I still, I don't know. I, I think the micro story is, is the, the thing that gets me. Like that could f- be a problem by the way just because you you revisit areas. So yeah. if you don't collect things the first time through, things appear later too, but if you don't collect things the first time through, then you might collect things yeah. drastically I, I'm, out of order. Yeah. As, yeah. I'm notoriously bad at that. Like Bioshock is probably like the only game that I think did it in a way that that I just naturally gelled with. And I was just like, okay, what's next? And But, you know, this, I mean, there's a lot of really interesting. I, what I One of my favorite things about this is actually pull stuff from Dead Space 2. I think like the intro, the intro call uh, that is like the the, the first cutscene of Dead Space Two is actually in this game as like an audio log, and so they they do a lot of good ju- they do a lot of good work tying this game to the original uh, sequel to so the point where like I actually think you're probably better off playing this and then going to Dead Space Two and Three as is than you were going from the original moving forward because I mean the first one was obviously not necessarily designed with the intention of a of a guaranteed sequel in mind uh, where they did where they made all these character decisions like giving Isaac a voice and. And um, I don't know, I man, there's just like a lot to like about it. It's also just a very playful game in in a weird way. Like, I, like it's very sci fi and it's very horror and it's scary. But I love that they kept the the chapter Easter eggs. Like, I love that that's still there. And for those of you who don't know, if, if anybody's like listening, it's when you line them up, right? It's when you line it like so. The first yeah. like the mission uh, the missions as they go are new arrivals, intensive care of. Uh, course correction, obliteration, imminent, lethal devotion, environmental hazard, into the void, search and rescue, dead on arrival, end of days, alternate solutions, dead space. And if you line up the first letter of each of them, it spells out Nicole is dead. And I love that. So that's so that's so of that era or just Mm -hmm. like that was like around the era that that stuff was kind of going away. And it makes me sad because I I love Easter eggs like that. Um. But it's we try to do that shit like that in our games. Just no one cares. It's cool, though. (laughs) Like, I I like it. It's It's some of my favorite shit. Well, like I I did. I tried to do a meta, like tell do a meta thing with the trophies, for for instance, with with Twin Breaker, trying to use all song names and stuff like that and trying to it was just it was not worth the effort. All right. uh, Dustin, do you have anything you'd like to add to this? Because I knew you you cut in earlier, but I, I assume I assume you have more to. (laughs) <laughs> to say you assume <laughs> you know what happens correctly so the thing for me i love the <clears throat> unitology aspect that's one of the most interesting aspects of the story to me mainly because i think let's see it was yeah 2012 there's a movie that came out came out called the master uh which is basically that's a pt anderson film that's kind of inspired by scientology it's 
really awesome. It's a really good, good movie. I've never seen it, but that kind of got me interested in what Scientology was just because I had always heard of it about being this kind of weird, uh, predatory in a lot of ways, uh, religion, I guess. And so around a little later, there was a documentary called going clear, which I know uh, there's many, uh, Scientology documentaries, but going clear is a, a, a really good one to watch. And so knowing some of the, uh, ways that they operate and then playing dead space, it's so very clear that they designed the unitologists around Scientology specifically in that in the unitology, or at least from what you read in the audio logs is that there are different levels that you can achieve or get to within the community and the religion. And those are around money. And I I'm pretty sure there's, there's like backstory about how Isaac had to go to a different school that wasn't as prestigious because his mom spent all their money trying to achieve higher levels of within the, the unitology uh, religion. So it's a, it's a really neat way to kind of just, you know, make that comparison in, in a, in a video game in a way that makes sense. I like how too, that it ties in, it kind of is mixing Scientology along with this like uh, cosmic horror of this thing that makes people crazy and then melt into weird monsters. So I don't know, like that, that's very appealing to me in, in, in two very different ways that they're able to, to mix into something very cool. And I don't know, in some ways I was thinking about just from a negative aspect, I guess, is that there's some story things that, I don't know. They may be able to be explained to me and then they wouldn't be negative to me. But there are some things that feel like convenient mechanics of the marker, specifically about Isaac forgetting everything before he goes there. That's one one thing I didn't really understand is that he doesn't remember this about Nicole. Right. Right. But he was never around the marker. So is that just directly from his grief around his parents and Nicole dying that he is totally in denial, which at that point I'm like, well, if he, if this guy is that mentally deranged, surely it would show in other ways and they wouldn't put this guy on a ship (laughs) to, Mm. to go do something. So I was like, that feels there's some things that feel a little weird from a writing perspective that I guess if we just accept at face value, which is fine. Not I'm I'm not the, I'm gonna be a total stickler about everything, but there's a couple things I was like, eh, I don't know about that. But overall, well, it's cool. But doesn't he? I'm just reading the synopsis. I just went to Wikipedia to read the synopsis. It says while exploring and repairing the issue, Mora Isaac briefly reunites with Nicole and meets Cross. She it, he is within the proximity of the marker at that point. At that point, but she's already dead, right? Right. So, but yeah. but is but the. Is it established that he understands that before he gets there? Because I guess what I'm saying is like that that change could have just happened while the game was going. And we don't know. I, I guess I, I, I I'm trying this to is, remember. Yeah, this is the I beat the game three times. So it's a little disappointing <laughs> that I don't don't remember this. This is the, the thing about just three one one after the other. Right. Just, so um, and I'm like I said, I'm I'm trying to be open if 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 you're a listener. No, no, I think you, you're you could be yeah. right. I'm just trying to explain maybe like how they were explaining that was that the, the, the psychosis didn't really begin until he arrived. You know, right. and, and they arrive like they come in hot. The ship is basically fucked. Yeah. So who knows, like if that jarred the marker and, and I, I don't know. I don't know if that's explained anywhere. Someone probably has an answer to that. I don't. I don't do you want to write in about it? You can if you want. I don't care. <laughs> I, th- I think I think I yeah. do think the implication is that um, because there's an implication at the end that he didn't finish or that you you when you assume control of Isaac have not finished watching the video call that nicole sends you because at the end you're shown the whole thing right and it kind of paints a different picture right and the assumption i guess at the beginning is that he's going there to find nicole and when he learns that she's alive air quotes right gotcha uh, it kind of triggers like oh she's she's around so it's like and then that's that's kind of explained that way or like maybe he I don't know if it's explained that he doesn't finish the video before or he just like he feels like something is wrong and then he cuts it off and then he goes um, or if he he assumes she's dead but has to go anyway because she's there on the ship that he happens to be working for. Right. Um, I, I'm not super sure about it, to be honest. I'm, that the, sounds fair, though. 
That's the Google right. search. I'm seeing mixed results. Some people saying <laughs> Isaac didn't know Nicole was dead. Some people are saying Isaac knew she was dead the whole time. So oh, see, I didn't think that. Yeah. Either way, I I don't know. That well, a, that can't be true. I mean, no. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, he must at least think that there's something he can do, at the right. very least. Or there's hope. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but it is purposely maybe amorphous. You know, maybe they kind of leave it. So it is. Or unless you just, yeah, unless Dustin just caught something and you were just completely retconning here. But either way, you got to suspend your disbelief because I just want to hunt down monster space zombies. Yeah, I just want to yes. blow, <laughs> blow in and blow monster skin off their bones. Dude, that. So, so some background on that. Chris mentioned about blowing off enemy skin on the show. I was like, oh, that sounds interesting. The moment it, I did it with that one gun, I immediately texted Chris. Yeah. I was like, yeah, that's pretty good. Oh you you were right about that. Imagine the haunting. Imagine animating that. I always it's think so about that. Cool. It's so like you're the one who's animating that for a fucking two weeks or whatever. <laughs> oh, dude. I'd have a field day. If I was talented enough to do that, I'd have, I'd have a field. It's like, oh, man, what can I do? That's do I want to do I wanna make it? Do I want to make it banana like? Mm-hmm. <laughs> do I want to make it like a like a yeah? Like he a, buys like bananas and peels them to see. Yeah, no. yeah, do I, yeah, do <laughs> dude. It sounds so fun. Study. We must oh have had such a good God. time. Um. All right. Well, let's talk about Isaac a little bit deeper as a, a mode of gameplay. Obviously, this is a third person shooter, and we know that Isaac Clark arrives at the USG Kellyan or with the USG Kellyan rather, which is a repair ship coming to the Ishimura. Nishimura is a planet cracker. I love this entire thing. And this is one of the things I love about this game is how it introduces elements of this far future science fiction where we are to mine things. We are now just blowing planets apart and like ripping pieces of them up and then bring and controlling them with tethers and mining them in those situations. So, so cool and so imaginative. And I love that aspect. It's not important at all but it's that's what that's what's going on in the age of seven is obviously um like i said had come across the uh the marker so they're all fucked up the people that are in the kelly and don't know that's including isaac clark who has was said earlier is not a soldier but an engineer that is certainly one of the things that makes him so appealing is because he's not really made for this and he's not really using the, the, the tools of the trade per se which is a very very neat idea as well and, and, a, and a differentiator for this game too uh, and another thing and dig we'll go to you with this is um the, one of the things I love about playing as Isaac Clark, and I know Chris will appreciate this too, but um, when we get to him, but is this is one of the games that introduced minimal minimalistic um, UI, and they did it in such a clever way that it's it's almost impossible to not copy how they did it. I mean, the Callisto Protocol totally copies it. Obviously, it's an ode to Dead Space, but the idea of kind of having a marker somewhere on your body in a third person setting to indicate health and maybe you have another meter in this case it would be for kinesis and then you also have just the numbers for your weapons as hollow as basically holograms above your weapon and even the inability to pause because you're bringing things up again everything happening in real time you're bringing something up and seeing a heads-up display presumably so there's a lot of cleverness it makes you feel like you're isaac i really dig playing as him i love the character we haven't seen him since uh playstation all-stars battle royale dlc Remember that when when oh, Isaac Clark was one of the, the the characters released in that. So <laughs> That's uh, amazing. So what do you think? And and of course, also Dig and I want I want to know your opinion on this as an artist. Uh, is the armor I think is iconic as well. So talk to me about um, Isaac Clark. What you think of him and and how you feel about playing as him. And I would love to hear you speak on the art and the UI and other things that speak to you. Yeah, I mean it's fascinating. And you said it. You know, I mean, I think at the highest level, this game is built upon one very important, simple brilliant but elegant premise you know you're taking the whole patented stop the zombie by shooting it in the noodle model and you're totally standing on its head in a very simple way and it plays into what you just said you know you're playing your protagonist the hero is an engineer he's not a soldier he's not a combatant so what do you do you have to neutralize the threat by using these futuristic power tools you know and the whole thing is you have to stop them you know you have to sever their limbs disarm them or immobilize them or slow them down by taking out their legs. I mean, it's a it's a it's very it's a gratuitous thing, right? Because we want to we're in for the horror, we're in for the violence. It's fun to do. It's very satisfying as Chris said. But it's also a great idea because you don't see a hero. It's not your typical Bruce Willis die-hard action hero or aliens <laughs> where you're a colonial marine and you're a soldier. You have to do it by the means you know. 
And it just happens to be very satisfying and ultra violent. And I love too that you could just, you know, it's so far flung into the future that you could just totally use your imagination for the weapons, how they work, how they're enhanced. It's beautiful. And yeah, just building is such a simple idea of building in your status in a third person, you know, shooter motif where, you know, you could see your health cage, you could see your stasis, you could see your vitals, everything pops up. It's brilliantly done from a visual presentation, but it's also just awesome and fluid for gameplay. You know, it's just it's just a really awesome thing to ha- to be able to interface with something so thoughtful like that. And um, I think everything in this game play, which I realized maybe not in the initial version, but in this remake, everything kind of plays into a momentum. It's very fluid. It really moves forward at a brisk pace. It goes as fast as you want. There's very little hiccups. I mean, I was getting so critical of that. I was like interacting with the bench when you want to enhance your suit or your weapons takes like a second too long. Like that Mm -hmm. animation with the on like, like I was getting so nitpicky with it. That's how great it is. Like it moves at a really, it's, it's really hiding the load. They hide the loads and everything, which is totally, there there is, there's no loading. Um, It's so so smooth, even saving, Mm -hmm. you know, it's Mm -hmm. like a moment. You know, it's just like, it just, it's a, it's a click, a beat, and then you're back in. And, you know, the art direction down from Isaac's armor design to the environments, like any classic sci-fi you could think of. I thought of a lot, oddly, about Star Wars with this. Just the initial trilogy in that six or seven year period from the late 70s through the early 80s. And how you could think those first three Star Wars movies, they're so different, but there's such a cohes- cohesion in the art direction among all of them. And this has that too, because it's a, it's a relatively long game. And no matter where you are on the Ishimura or the Valor and the various places, the art direction is very, very cohesive with the lighting, with the look. You know, you have that ribbing motif from Isaac's suit through the exterior of the Ishimura, the interiors, the computer consoles. Everything lives in a very cohesive space. You know, everything works together. Every nuance is thoughtful. And... um the other thing I thought about, though, with Isaac and having a voice in this version, which I know I realized later on they did that and they kind of retconned it and pulled it back into the first version for the remake. There's something kind of interesting to me about keeping it silent, just mm-hmm. because I think it would emphasize the isolation and the loneliness and the dread a little more. Like I had a vision like maybe you just read odd, you know, logs for intermittent information or Maybe any audio or visual stuff that you pull up is not in real time. So you're seeing things, distress calls or information from that's logged or that was once recorded just to kind of further that thing of like you're by yourself here or at least communicating to people that are on other ships or on other planets far away. So to really increase that dread. So I think you guys are right. I think giving our protagonist a voice was risky. But I got to say, at first I thought. The voice, um, who is it? Gunnar Wright, who does the voice. Yeah. I thought it was like a little pedestrian and conventional at first, but it really grew on me in just a matter of hours. Um, not only does it have that gravelly texture to his voice that's really interesting, but he should kind of sound like an everyman a little bit. You know, again, it's not, mm-hmm. I just came off of Uncharted 4 for the first time too, and this is not Uncharted 4 levels of voice acting. So I was coming in extra critical with that. But I think it worked. I think it worked for the character. And also he has he's personally invested in this story. So to give him a voice just kind of increased the drama, I think. And um, you know, he the humanity and the emotion, I guess. Yeah. I I I I I'm a big fan of silent protagonists in general. Like I just think that I, I just think they work better in most cases. I think it's why some of the most beloved video game characters like throughout the generations have been just like characters that are are kind of slates for you to project yourself onto. But sure. the, the one thing that w- the original Dead Space was a little... It, I felt like it was a weird choice for the original Dead Space. Only because, again, you're playing this character already. He has a full name. He has a relationship <laughs> that he's going... He's going to save his girlfriend, you know, from this ship. He's working alongside people who speak to him. And he just says nothing. And it's just kind of like, even in the original game, I was like, it's a weird choice just because it feels, it feels a little bit disconnected. I get that it adds some level of 
isolation and it, it definitely does but it also kind of like is disconnected from like the actual narrative of what's going on whereas like i feel like this game this game i mean isaac's still very quiet in this game he doesn't speak like all the time he, he does speak generally like when he's spoken to which makes sense um and yeah he does sound like just some every, he just sounds like a guy he even looks like just some guy like i, lo- I love that <laughs> I, I love everything about like the, the way that they chose to characterize him uh, in comparison to especially like just what they could have done. Oh my God. You imagine they made him snarky and just like quipping all the, Oh my, mm-hmm. Oh man. That would have been, I wouldn't even surprise me though. Like it seems so possible now. Cause like, that's such an obvious decision not to do, but like then people do it. And it's like, what did I just I blow that guy's skin off? <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> gross. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, to- exactly. I would say the the voice acting I liked, and the only thing that annoyed me, and this is just a very Colin thing, is just the constant like, if you're like half injured or worse, like, Ugh. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you want to cure as soon as possible. It's like, come on, man. I, I'm trying. This is a survival horror game. Maybe do it once or twice if you went to indicate you're that injured, and maybe once yeah. in a blue moon. But the screen should kind of indicate that. And this is a survival horror game, so healing items are are kind of premium and I'm not always going to be spending them. So I just thought that was a weird like that. If I were a play tester, I would have been like, that's driving me fucking insane. You got to do something about <laughs> yeah. that. But maybe someone did say that and, that, and they didn't care. I do want to um, say but, one thing quick. Yeah, no, please. I wanted to go back to you and get more from you about the UI and the aesthetic and whatever yeah. else you want to say. Yeah, just I mean, obviously, we've talked about this a great deal. I, I love I, I use the word diegetic a lot where it's probably not appropriate, but I love the idea of a diegetic HUD or, or like just a display that gives you all of the necessary gameplay information within the context of the universe that makes sense. And so that, that, that extends to the holograms on top of the guns that extends to the life bar on, on Isaac's back and and the the stasis gauge and on Isaac's back. And it works so well in dead space specifically because there are lights and you're in dark environments nearly always. And I think that that contrast really like, because if it was a design element, like having your HUD in the center of the screen or like having your life bar be a vertical bar in the center of the screen would be insane. But it works so well in the game because it's it's married to the environment. It's married to the storytelling. It's, and it's fantastic design. That suit is so iconic. And, and I also love the fact that it's so far in the future, but things don't look, you know, white or, or you know what I mean? Like that, that right, standard... Right, right. Like, and I love that in some cases too. Like, obviously like there are places like Mass Effect where I think it it does great. It does a great service to like the design and the overall look, but I love something that takes place in the future that still looks like crimey and, and, and utilitarian. Right. Like alien. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like alien. Like there's like that, that eighties kind of sci-fi where you would still be in the future and there'd still be amazing pieces of technology, but we haven't, we, we haven't really strayed so far from function over aesthetic or whatever and it's and right. it's like I, I i love that look and i love the look of the computer turn the futuristic computer terminals that still look miles beyond what we have now but 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 are in these dingy offices and and there's a there's a room specifically that i love later on in the game where there's just like a bunch of bodies on meat hooks and it's just like oh god this is grimy as fuck <laughs> yeah it's it's, it's so got cool. you- Another another product or another sci-fi product that does that really well, I think, is Battlestar Galactica, specifically in uh, in its dichotomy that it draws between the very gritty humans and the very clean <laughs> Cylons whose yeah. ships have no buttons and no doors and and, nothing. and then you go to the human ships and they're, they look like basically like a children's room, a teenager's room with clothes drawn, drawn, thrown everywhere and fucking dirt, <laughs> drinks spilled. And yeah, yeah it's cool. I, I love, love that, that too. Shit. Yeah. Um, Dustin, let's hear from you about the aesthetic and the visual language. I'm curious if anything sticks out to you about those things with Dead Space that you'd like to discuss. Yeah. So really playing this game reminded me of, I think I maybe shared this on Sacred a while ago, but many of you know, I used to be a videographer before I did this job. And one, so normally it was like dance recitals and, you know, weddings and stuff like that. But we would work for like do random videos for local businesses. And here in my town, there is a steel mill that we got to go and tour and film the entire steel mill. And it was a really awesome, enlightening and also horrifying experience when you're in these giant warehouses filled with 
giant machinery that's spitting out metal that will melt your face like instantly if you get even near it. Like some of the times I was old. I made metal man. (laughs) Not again. Yeah, Yeah, sorry. I would I would be holding the camera near this this like steel that would come out and it literally I would feel like I had a sunburn walking away because it was like the the amount of heat radiating and they're just dirty and disgusting places and it's funny because they were even I remember talking to one of the employees they're like oh yeah we just cleaned this area up for the video and it's like dude there is grease on every step and every railing and is like it is just a disgusting nasty place and I mean as it should be you're it's a highly like mechanical non-human environment and that's what this reminded me of so much and i love the the way they marry you know we were talking about the lighting but also the sound design with as you're walking through and you hear the these machines that and and oftentimes you are having to navigate through them as well as as different barriers and obstacles throughout the game and and maybe you're even like lining things up to try to like have an enemy get smashed in the machine and so yeah, I don't know if we mentioned the sound design at all of this game, but I think it, it's definitely worth um, shouting out for multiple reasons, not only just with the way it marries to the environment, but the sounds the different enemies make. And uh, particularly I, if you're playing with headphones, uh, hearing them come up behind you with the 3D audio and stuff, it all really adds to this level of immersion with this game. And that's the thing that more and more I think I've been thinking about, particularly with Hogwarts Legacy and playing VR and Dead Space is that all three of those things are very, very immersive, but for different ways with, you know, Hogwarts is very detail oriented. It feels very lived in and every, you know, the call the production per square inch. Mm. And this is immersive in a totally different way that is also very valid in how it feels real and how disgusting and how powerful these machines are and stuff like that. It's it's all really, really good. I want to before we move on, because there's so many other things I want to discuss with you guys, I, I will touch on a, a couple of things that are related to what we were already talking about. One thing, as I said earlier, that I love what games do fiction. Um, I, I look at I look at in um, post-apocalyptic or dystopian fiction for this a lot. This is not this, but something like Handmaid's Tale really excels at this, which is trying to tell you something about the world by just being in, in spaces. So like you're in a kitchen setting and you're looking around and they're talking about something unrelated, but you're like, okay, they have some pretty high quality meat, access to vegetables, no canned goods, no, like, no, uh, doesn't seem like the electricity is working, all these kinds of things. And you're just trying to gleam information about the existence of these people. And I love doing stuff like that. And I think that there are people that are really attentive to things like that. And I think they do a really nice job in Dead Space of things like this. I specifically wanted to point out um, the really excellent fake ads and the really excellent propaganda. Um, I love that stuff in games. I think Bioshock is, again, the master yeah, of that. Yeah. Um, I think that takes a lot of intelligence and it's cool. And that must be very fun if you're a really talented artist, like a graphic artist, to be able to do stuff like that, to make fake ads and make fake propaganda and, and look at the real propaganda of history and, and try to fit something that, that reads in that same language. So I think that that's really cool. And I wanted to just say this um, as we go on to the next section. And I, I, if you guys have anything to say about it, you're more than welcome to. When we play games so far in the future, I can't help but think about what we would actually sound like, because the one thing that's for sure is that we are not going to sound like they sound in this game. And the reason I say that is because language is constantly evolving. 500 years is a long time. And if you go back 500 years with English, we're somewhere in middle English and we, you and I would not even really be able to understand a lot of it, at least not easily. If yeah. You read it. You're gonna have to read it carefully. If you if you sit there, they're not going to even understand what you're saying to them. And it, it's it's there's a barrier there. And I'm always interested in what we will actually sound like. It's not something that they could figure out, obviously, and it's not something that you would even want to see. But I can't help but think about it because uh, and I know, Dig, you would be able to relate to this, especially, but I'm sure the others, too, is. When you hear something from 50 years ago or 60 or 70 years ago, you know, it's from them just by the way they're talking, their intonation and what they're saying. Oh, that's fine. You know, uh, or women with the very like, well, you know, like when they would begin to th- when they begin to say something, they like interview. What do you think, a young woman about this? <laughs> well, yeah, I very think, era yeah. specific. Right. Aspects. And I'm like, well, that's 1955. I mean, it's got to yeah. be 1960, 1965. <laughs> no one sounds like that. No one sounds like that today. 
And no one says, no one, no one goes in and, and um, says, their dad, hey, dad, I'm going to go out and play basketball. And he's like, oh, that's fine, son. <laughs> I love that. We should return. Why can't we return to that? So right. elegant. Oh, that's so fine. Um, <laughs> that's so, fine. So I just, I just think about that with this. Like we would have no idea, comprehension of what they're even speaking probably yeah. at this point. And I just, I just, yeah. I'm not, it has nothing to do with the game. I just like thinking about that stuff. No, we can't it's, quite it's, replicate the futuristic yeah, as, me, as is, well as we can. As we think it, it's placing our, our ourselves as we currently are into the future is what, is what a lot of these stories end up being. And thank God, because I don't know, man, like I've seen a lot of uh, when 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 when, <laughs> when stories try to invent their own like future slang or like future ways of talking or like this is what haircuts will look like in five minutes <laughs> and it's just nonsense and it's like who it might be accurate but it just looks fucking stupid right now <laughs> so don't do that i remember see, i remember like <laughs> noticing this during the watching the halo show and they try to make this like futuristic uh, i don't know this the, like these dumb haircuts and i'm like this just looks like this just looks like an absolute abortion <laughs> and I don't, it doesn't feel genuine. Like I, I, like I would rather they just looked like it, it just it doesn't add anything like when you because 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 then it immediately the audience thinks like you think you're smart enough to really like to really get it right you think you think this is what we're gonna look like in 500 years and you think you're smart <laughs> enough to tell us like no dude <laughs> like yeah why fucking, would you do it that just way put us yeah, as it, we are for and fuck's it, sake. It, Totally, I agree with you because and because we see, we have so much evidence of times changing. Dagan and right. I on Knockback always talk about how funny we think it is, how old, and I, I don't mean this to be insulting, but how old women look in old movies and TV shows because they were trying to. That was what right. was like attractive was like Mature. sharp, sharp, yeah, sharp edges and you know features and all those kinds of things that <laughs> aged you up. And right. that's not no one does that anymore at all. Like I still watch shit from that era, thinking. Like when I watch Seinfeld and Seinfeld's got his like some of his girlfriends, I'm like, that chick is 15 years older than I am, you know, but I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm 38. She's probably like fucking 25. <laughs> it hasn't changed, you know? even though we've gotten right. Older. It's like it's it's very it's very strange. So I, I just I love I think you're absolutely right, Chris, that like you just can't really do it. But I love thinking about. Oh, yeah. And maybe yeah. this will all exist in 500 years and people will look back and be like and and Dead Space will need to be translated in some way or it'll be like an old kind of archaic way of speaking and i dig that a lot i don't know i just wanted to throw that out there let's go Kyle, on to i love oh, do you yeah. mind i just love no, no, what please. you said about the posters and the iconography and throwing it back to bioshock how how amazing that was and you know the ads and all that because you know what i love about that it's what they it's similar to what they figured out in movies years ago it's like show a really violent scene and play a really sweet ch- children's song over it like that you sort of um you know, it's like having that opposite approach. It's a reminder of what the world was like before everything went to shit, first of all, which makes it even more eerie. And there's something really about that sort of contrast where you're butchering some alien monster with this crazy severe weapon with this sweet cartoon poster in the background. Like there's just something there's something crazy about that. Mm-hmm. It's a juxtaposition. You know, something horrific about that. Right. Right. Exactly. Um, yeah, I think you're right, Chris, too. It's, yeah, it's like juxtaposing. I mean, The Last of Us does that, you know? Um, yeah. yeah, I think, I think, yeah. I think the best shit really does that to full effect. I, I think it's why, I think it's actually solely like, like the main reason why Fallout is so, so Fallout's powerful. A good example. Like just, just, just like, oh, hey, here's these, these songs from like the forties sung by people who are undoubtedly currently dead. So that, or that already is like vaguely haunting as it is and I then it's like just ju- and it's juxtaposed you're hearing like you know shaboom by the crew cuts while you're <laughs> while you're being descended upon by ghouls and it's it's just so cool and and bioshock too with you know the the pleasant kind of swing music playing while you were running through this dilapidated you know party like by this in this dilapidated bar where like people got murdered and it was, it's so cool it's good shit. Uh, it's the best shit all right, let's move on to playing the game as we're over an hour in. I'm sure people want to hear a little bit about that, too. Um, I love third person shooters. I love third person action. I love first person shooters, too. Less, I'm less interested in first person action, which is why I think it's strange that I'm so into games like Dying Light and others. But I just think there are certain games that do it well. But generally speaking, for action, I'm going to want 
third person. This is much more of a shooter, though. Uh, it's not cover based or anything like that. I think it it is a really fluid play. I'll be interested to hear what you guys think about that. I'd also love to know, and Dustin, we can start with you. What, what were some of the guns that you preferred? What did you think of some of the enemies? I must say that one enemy that haunted me was the baby enemies that you encountered. Just mm. because I don't really know that I remembered that's what they were in the first one. I don't know if they hit you over the head as hard in the first one. I don't know. It's been a long time. But but I, I was like, oh my God, that's so dark. And I was so surprised to even see that replicated. That seems like that you could describe that as being a, a bridge too far for some people. It's very similar to in Fallout 3 when you there's like a whole town of and the game is 15 years old you had your chance or you can skip ahead a few seconds <laughs> but uh there's a town of like a children and you can't kill any of them you can kill anything in the game that you want anyone you want but you can't aim your gun at kids and so it always seemed like and that was then and so it always seemed like we would become more sensitive to that and so i just was thinking about that as i was playing i was like wow that's interesting because i can imagine someone really being disturbed by watching these babies come out of their fucking back to tank like things and spawn these huge tentacles and they're just horrifying. But yeah, Dustin, let's begin with you. What did you think about the act of playing Dead Space Remake? Yeah. So the plasma cutter, I mean, I feel like this is the the goaded weapon oh, here. Yeah. And that was it's one of those things where it's the it's the first weapon you get. It's really effective. And at least for me, I felt like it was the most like I could reliably know that I would probably have ammo for it. So that was the gun that I was consistently upgrading the most. But I have to give a shout out to the Ripper as well, which while I don't think is in the top echelon of effective weapons, it's just really fun because it's literally sawing a guy like you you, you pull out or, or you can even shoot them and they bounce around it. That's like almost a comical aspect of this game is when you can like it's like multiple layers first you blast their skin off and then you're shooting saw blades at them and they're bouncing around ricocheting around like a cartoon <laughs> i love that i love how you can kind of figure out different combinations of weapons in order to really maximize and like the flamethrower stuff like that there's just enough variety in there and like i said earlier i really like that it did a good job in in forcing me to not just get comfortable with a few select weapons really uh, in a lot of ways reminded me of of Doom Eternal, specifically in the Doom Eternal has this thing where it's like it will never let you use the same weapon for a long time. It, it, it will. It's like, OK, well, yeah. you no longer have ammo for this. We're not going to give you any more ammo for this until you start using the other weapons or start doing the glory kills or something like that. Obviously, you could probably work around this in Dead Space by purchasing ammo or something like yeah, that. Yeah, an important thing is you can also just not any weapon you don't have equipped on you will never spawn ammo for you. So you can really force the game to give you ammunition for what you want. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, I I enjoyed that aspect of it. As far as specific enemies, I do have a complaint in that I don't really like the boss battles in this game. Particularly, there's the one where. You are going, I think you're outside and it's kind of like a circular, like half circle arena and you need to go and you need to use uh, the turrets, you, use the turrets. Mm. Sometimes I really like the turrets, but that one in particular, there was something that I wasn't quite getting. And then eventually I, I, I was like, oh, that's what I'm supposed to do. And then and then it was easy after that. It was tough. So, some of the boss battles, though, I, I don't know. Maybe it's just that one in the particular. I'm not saying the boss battles are just bad in this game, but. I like the turrets at other times, too. It gives like a nice like feeling when you're like pointing yeah. and shooting and, and think, blowing up asteroids yeah. and stuff like that. The, the, the outside turret section when you're kind of defending against the, the asteroids. I thought that was dope. Like, yeah, yeah. that part sucked in the original. <laughs> that part was so fucking horrible on the Godfather the engine. Like Dude. it was so bad in the original. I, I, I forgot it was in the game and then it came up and I was like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> turret section i forgot and then i it, it happened and i was like oh the turrets no become easy sucks the turrets become easier to use i think when you realize you can move you can aim and move with them yeah like you don't have to yeah. see yeah. them you can just use them from afar a little learning curve there yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um well yeah, and i guess yeah please i have a on. question for chris i guess yeah. in a way to hand it off to him is that i thought that the zero gravity sections of this game were really well done i felt like i had a lot of control over yeah. isaac and which is surprising. I mean, zero G stuff, I'm sure, is not 
easy to pull off in a way you don't want to make it too floaty, but you'd also want to lose some sense of control for the player. And Chris, I remember on Sacred, so you'll have to refresh me on this. That was totally redone for this, right? Like before, 100%. I remember about launching, like Isaac constantly launching off stuff over and over and it not being very good. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It used to be in the original game in 2008's Dead Space where you would, the zero gravity sections represented a space in in the environment where basically you could aim your gun, look at any surface, press the X or A button, depending on what console you're on, and then you would leap in a straight line to that surface and stick to it. And it was just, you know, it was, you know, it was archaic. It, it reminded me a little bit of, um, you know, the the kind of tanky Resident Evil, early yeah. Resident Evil controls where it's like, this is just, this is how we got to do it for now because we can't do any better right now. But I think, yeah, the zero gravity sections for this game were completely, I think every single zero G section in this game is like, completely new I, I don't think any of them even remotely match what came before because you can do so much more with it now and i think that's a system that they lifted from dead space 2 i think dead space 2 had proper zero g probably not as fluid as this is because obviously it's like a it's like many 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 years later but it's pretty damn close and you know i was i was just really thankful for that like because it's zero g is fun in this it's just fun to like fly around. It's really responsive. It feels really good to the point where I was playing it and I was like, I could see like multiplayer working in this, like actually like, because it, it actually feels fluid and you feel fast and you feel like you feel capable and strong, especially when you're in a room with a bunch of enemies coming at you and, and they can be anywhere in the room and you have to kind of rotate and aim and then they can leap at you. It's so cool. Like, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, if you, the boss battles in the original were rough, man. They were. They were, they were <laughs> I'm, I'm thankful for the zero G. What I'm curious what weapon what weapons everyone stuck to. Um, this was discussed a little bit, but I was surprised to hear that you kind of went through everything because I didn't use most of the weapons in the game until my third playthrough because the game just doesn't give you enough to upgrade effectively or enough ammunition yeah. to effectively use anything. So I uh, I stuck with the plasma cutter. What is it here? I have it written down. The plasma cutter, the pulse rifle, and the flamethrower. And the pulse rifle uh, secondary fire is probably the most useful yeah. weapon in the entire game. It actually made the game somewhat trivial. Um, Takes a lot of ammo, I, though, right? I, yeah, but, but I was going to say, especially because I, I learned how to spawn infinite ammo for the pulse rifle, Farm, which I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, not only, I did that not only for credits, but also for uh, for the ammo, ammo itself. But having that that alt fire and just blowing shit up basically one thing at a time like what when those little babies appeared for instance you just let their little tentacles come out and then you just pop them done once <laughs> the peacock babies yeah, yeah those like, friggin things man so uh i'm curious dig let's go to you what what did you uh what do you think about playing the game i'm curious what weapons you might have used as well you know what? i mean chris just reminded me of something we might have touched on it earlier but this is a weird game kind of an anomaly because the original is so good but then you realize how bad the original is because this game is so great but it's it's the weirdest thing. Like I never realized there were so many misses in Dead Space until they redid it, and I was like, "No, this is great." It's very strange how yeah. much better it is, and the I original mean, that, is still great. And it's yeah. fifteen years ago. But yeah, man, just I mean, you know what? I mean, you know what's really cool about this game, this experience? The core gameplay was probably enough because it's so good. But yeah. they give you so much variety, and almost all the variety is nearly flawless. You know, you get to explore get the combat which we already said was awesome the zero gravity which is really fluid you know you and you have little things you have the intership tram you have you get to explore a secondary spaceship at some point you get to grind for money you're grinding for nodes you're powering up your arsenal as strategically as you can you have those tentacle drag sequences you know intermittently kind of popped in which are you know kind of felt quick timey in a way but they were still fun oh yeah 100 percent. you know and then you get to manage, you know, it's just like, it's just enough challenge. It's just enough management. You know, you get the life gauge, your loadout, your ammo, your stasis charge, your oxygen level, whatever, you know, you get, get a little bit of uh there's a little bit of thoughtful gameplay involved. It's not just fisty cuffs and action and the weapons, man. I mean, that's where I struggled the most because I really wanted to experiment with each of the seven. And 
like you guys already sung the praises of the plasma cutter and it was awesome. And I did find myself modifying and upgrading it. I like souped it up to the ninth degree, maybe got pretty close to having it completely powered up. And so I was just one shotting fools with that, you know, eventually. And then realized like the pulse rifle is interesting because it's the only really military grade weapon and it's good for spamming or crowd control, but you're not going to, you're not going to blow limbs off with that one too easily. So, you know, yeah. you got to kind of pick and choose your battles with that one. What I loved in this game, first of all, the force gun is probably the most satisfying weapon I've ever used in a video game. <laughs> it's fantastic. But the one that really stole my heart was the contact beam. And I think that's the one you guys were saying could just melt the layers of skin and flesh off. I mean, that hum as it starts to spool up because it doesn't shoot right away. And then it just unleashes hell. And then, you know, you, the beam is so strong. It's like this melting laser beam of energy or whatever. You have to control it. You have to keep it straight because it wanders because it's so powerful. I thought that was so cool. And they, but they, they kind of nerfed it a little bit because, you know, you, it's hard to find ammo for ammo is rare for it. You have to use it strategically. Save. I definitely would not have beaten the hive mind at the end without that weapon. And then, you know, what's cool. I, there was really only, I didn't really like the Ripper at all. I have to disagree with Dustin on that one because, you know, I was afraid. And I think that was my cowardice. I was just afraid to get too close. You know, I want like a longer range weapon. And then the line gun, I felt like was just, it came along too far in the game to be useful. Like I was already powering up my plasma cutter and using all my nodes for that. Now I could have re- reassessed and taken things apart or whatever. But, you know, the line gun was something that was really probably the only one of the seven that I didn't get a chance to really, to really judge. Yeah, I must admit, I didn't use most of the weapons in the game until my third playthrough, like I said, even just to get yeah. the trophies. In fact, that was the purpose of my third playthrough, which is to just get the trophies for all the different kills, because I, I just knew from my experience in the original Dead Space, you really need to relegate it to a few weapons and choose your weapons. And once I fi- and pulse rifle is fucking horrible in the first game. But once I realized <laughs> once I realized that it had that that secondary fire, all the secondary fire stuff is new. Yeah, um, I was like, holy shit, this is a really, really powerful weapon. And then the flamethrower was used specifically just for a couple of those, like those crawly enemies that Face would come huggers. at you. And yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> and then my second playthrough was just using the the plasma cutter for that trophy. So I I just didn't even really experience many of these these amazing weapons until later. But I'm glad I didn't in my playthroughs just because it would have really complicated me having sufficient ammo for the guns I actually wanted to use. You know? Yeah. All right. Um, I don't know. No, you have I to say, say, yeah, please. Well, I got to say, I never even found the line gun. I don't even know where the hell that thing is. Oh, really? I no. never even used it. Yeah, I you never don't have unlocked to find it. it. Yeah. I never unlocked it. I never used it. I, I, I don't know where it is. I specifically was looking for it, too. And I remember being like, I, I remember feeling like, I feel like I'm pretty late in the game and I don't have this line gun. Where is it? And I, I made an effort to look for it and I couldn't, I don't know where the hell it is. I don't know if you normally come across it in the, campaign or or what but yeah i think you have to you have to backtrack i think with like one of the security cards or something yeah you know? i think oh. that's right yeah relatively late that's why yeah i feel like they maybe they they could have put that one somewhere earlier in the game you know maybe yeah well shout out to the force gun because oh, uh i don't know man <laughs> just like so- seeing just like a just like just like a boom just like just like an invisible air air blast just peel skin off of people is hilarious <laughs> like i never got tired of, especially like in in when and it was fun to use with with groups of the the tiny little like crawly enemies too because they would just like all pop and it was, it's it's damn good but the the plasma cutter is awesome i like the ripper too because I, I love getting in there like really close and just like cutting people's legs off and it's then chaotic them it's, it, it's, it's a chaotic, it's a chaotic it, but i love it because it's, it, it is the it is the weapon to me that feels the most like um is the weapon to me that feels the most like a really irresponsibly repurposed tool. <laughs> you know, like it, it feels like this is just a levitating saw blade. <laughs> and like, my God, this is how this is even remotely legal. <laughs> is Can you imagine this world? I, I won't even use an actual two, you know, 2023 buzzsaw. Like oh my God, the, I would never touch one of There's those There's no things. way. No, like no way. one that actually shoots, forget it. I'd kill myself within seconds. <laughs> Metal Man. 
That was what was so fucking cool about them. Our dad had those like metal blades that you'd use in saws. And I always wanted to like, I, I, well, that's the magnet that could back there on my shelf is the one I used to put on my head to pretend I was magnet, man. But metal (laughs) man had a metal man had a metal blade attached to his head. And I know I wanted to do that really bad, but was persuaded (laughs) not to. Mega man. I made microwave man (laughs) to heat up (laughs) my food, but now he's Chernobyl. It's to serve (laughs) humanity. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um i can't wait I, they're no doubt gonna reboot mega man i think they're that might even be it i don't know i have no information on this but i just feel like that's imminent in the next couple yeah. of years and uh yeah, i'll be really I interested to see so. how they work with all of that because they can make it so cool you should have let me r- write it you dumb <laughs> fucks all right um i want to ask about a, a few other things specifically about uh, some of the changes to the game and I don't know what you guys experienced here but I, and Dustin we'll go to you first is uh, did you explore or do any of the side quests how did you feel about their inclusion there's basically three of them um, that trail through the game and there are some changes to the floor plans and all that I don't know if you noticed any of that stuff but I think most importantly is that there is a new game plus and a special ending for the new game plus that you have to kind of court out of the game by finding pieces of the marker that only appear when you play it on new game plus, which I think is really cool. I don't know if any of you guys explored that and they actually have to be found in a specific order as well, which complicates it. And then you have to find this, this, this hidden space. One is there's basically like one in each chapter for the most part. And then you have to find this like hidden religious space and place all the markers around this like prayer circle and then just go beat the game. And then you'll get a special ending. So I'm, I'm, um, so Dustin, talk to me about these additions. I mean, did you experience any of them? How did you feel about them? Uh, and so on and so forth. I am trying so hard to remember. I feel like I did one of the side quests. Uh, I'm looking at them now. I think there's one where you're in like investigating in people's rooms and stuff. Um, but I, I mean, it was, it was cool. I guess I added more backstory, but the other ones I think I just skipped. I was really curious about one where you need to get all the upgraded like all the key cards or something yeah. in order to unlock something it was like pretty involved in order just to unlock this one room and i'm like man i really am curious what's back there i never looked that up but i did look up the alternate ending just because i didn't do a new game plus because i just wanted to move i think i think i beat it the day before hogwarts legacy came out so it was one of those like one thing done move on to the next but I don't know how I feel about uh, the alternate ending, just in that I don't like that there's two potential paths. Right. This I, is I, the infamous problem that yes. infamous two had to deal with. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't like that. Just just give me at this point. I mean, there was a time when I liked this idea of multiple endings. I think it was unique during that era when we were seeing a lot of them that it was like, oh, you can really craft your own story. But then as we started to play these games and the veil was lifted, it was like, oh, you make two or three decisions and you get two or three different cutscenes, And then ultimately for the sequel, the developer is going to just pick one of them. So if you pick something else, your choice is not really valid, at least for a sequel. So I hate that. And I kind of am annoyed that they did that in this game as well, but just because I don't know if let's say you beat this game, you didn't know about the secret ending or if you just played and moved on. And then the sequel involves that directly. And you're like, oh, I don't I didn't realize that happened. Then you just got to go and YouTube it. And it, I don't know. It just seems yeah. just tell a finite story. I, an agree, I agree with you, I think. But I think the way I'm going to read this is. The, they're probably going to stick with the original ending. And that what they're going to say is, is that you can't even experience the second ending until you play the game. There's no way for you to see it without having mm-hmm. first seen the first ending. And so maybe that, that's their way of saying this is kind of what's set into motion. And this is like an alternate reality of that or an alternate mm-hmm. outcome that doesn't matter as much. Yeah. I, if you look at the trophies, you can just see for yourself how many people have even seen the, the ending. I guess that can't gleam onto the people that YouTube did and all that, like you said. Chris, go on. No, well, I was, I was going to say, like, I think the fact that you have to see the canon ending first and also the fact that there are two sequels True. um you know i don't know what they'll do for dead space 2 because apparently like that one's pretty widely loved even though it's not you know as esteemed as the second one so i don't know if they're gonna reboot it or or, or continue from here but that secondary ending or anything like that i always kind of viewed as like a like a what if like and in games used to do that a lot there was there were what if modes in in old ps1 games or it's just like let's it's the same campaign as the first one 
or or as the normal one, but it's just full of fucking nonsense. Spider Man's uh, NeverSoft Spider Man game did that a lot, and I I loved it. Dude, mm-hmm. Silent um, Hill does that. Yeah, I'm Silent curious if they'll keep. Well, I guess it's Silent Hill too. I'm thinking of Silent Hill One has some like comedy, and yes, yeah. dude, they're just that's <laughs> that, a little I, different to me. I don't know, like that. Maybe I'm being hypocritical. I don't know. I need to think on this. That that's that Silent Hill ending is fucking iconic. That ridiculous one. <laughs> yeah. That that is. That is <laughs> I think that might be one of the one of the endings that really got me. Like maybe I should pay attention to video games. Like <laughs> yeah. this is fucking insane. But Mul- uh, multiple endings is a is a mistake. I think for the most part. I think that's cool. Like Castlevania Two is the first game I remember having multiple endings, and so it's it's an old thing. But I. It's just tell me your story. You can tell me your story. It's okay. I, I would. I mean, yeah. I would agree with that in in very specific <laughs> circumstances because, like, there are games where, like, that's the whole point. You know, like Mass Effect. Like, I mean, what I think what makes Mass Effect two so special is the fact that so much can go wrong. You know, and and that and that will have an effect on on the future in like a tangible and and uh, realistic way and there are even some games where i feel like if you're not if there's no sequel intended or really even remotely planned i think it's totally fine to have like you know your choices matter and impact the ending but the issue comes when you have a game that maybe they weren't planning a sequel for and then you have all these different paths and then it does super well and then you have to make another one and then you have to pick that's kind of like i don't know it's 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 weird i don't i don't think there's anything wrong with multiple endings but yeah def- definitely prefer uh, a standard like unified vision for a story provided that multiple endings isn't the foundation of what makes the game special. Um, and that's, I think the caveat. Yeah. yeah. I, I think another important thing to note and to just underline is the idea of like the era, which a lot of this stuff kind of hailed from a lot of the choice based stuff hailed from originally. And that, that was an aberration in in some sense like i think mass effect fooled people in a while i i mean i remember even thinking this at at ign i was like is this really is this the future like and i think that it just wasn't no one else even tried it was so hard it was so like, hard I, yeah exactly I, it was so I, and, I, and it, by the way they got fucking destroyed by the end over it so why would anyone ever do it is you know i'll never forget mass effect 3 ever I think, what an interesting yeah. what an interesting game that was mass effect 3 Right. Uh, just oh, just on, to, on the record by the way i thought that ending was fine and everybody needed to fucking me chill <laughs> me too but Colin, um, you think it's fine i never i didn't know that i didn't know that that's new information to me <laughs> that's why that's my first that's, that's You're my telling first, me this for the first time that, that was yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that trump video was like you're just telling me for the first time but <laughs> well, that, what is that what, what is that song that's playing in the background uh, tiny dancer <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was uh, I thought it was that like nothing's okay with me these days I got a good job I got a good office <laughs> it's, a, it's just such a ridiculous it's just such a rid- <laughs> ridiculous accompaniment to what's going on but I mean this is a, this is a tangent but like the I, I think that's the first my first uh, cognitive recognition of Colin as a person was was about that with that Mass Effect thing and I remember reading it before I even remotely knew you or had any chance of even thinking that I would, thinking like this is kind of entirely fine. I, I that's don't understand. Funny. I don't understand. Yeah, that was like my. That's probably that's still looked at as like one of my most ignominious moments, if not like my worst moment. That and the the my op ed about how the Vita was going to kill um, <laughs> are the two that people like to point at the most. It used to insult me, and I can I can understand that it's it, it's you know you don't want people to think bad things of you, but I, I'm also like. You remember this? That's pretty crazy that I, I, you remember me for any reason. So I'm, you yeah. know, I'm, I'm down with that. I've kind of come to embrace it as I've gone on. But that Mass Effect three, like the way I positioned that video, was was a mistake. I'd love to do like a something with Damon one day, my my old friend from IGN that did that video with me about how much fallout we got for it, um, which was funny. It was. It felt. I, it felt very real at the time. But yeah, yeah, it really meant nothing at all. Go on. I think what you said was overall correct you know about it but i don't know i don't even what's funny is that i don't even remember that happening and i was like real into that stuff at the time but yeah i mean you missed i mean i'm there's so at that time there were so many things to pay attention to so many websites and personalities and podcasts and whatever i mean that's the way it is now but i think it's in some way it's more streamlined because no one pay what we know is that no one pays attention to the old stuff anymore so yeah everyone's over on on this side now but 
Um, all right. That's I want to. Uh, Dave, do you have anything you want to say about this before we? Uh, uh, you know, I don't know how much I have a value to add. I mean, I could say I never knew Game Plus a day in my life. You know, I was very linear with this. I was also terrified I wasn't going to finish it in time. I think I had five days. You know, so I was. You know, I can't mess with the sacred, the sacred boys. You know, I had to get it done. And I also, you know, so I was linear. I did stumble upon some of the side questy stuff, sort of half by accident. Like I remember getting a couple, maybe one or two of those mini monoliths. Oh, sorry, markers. Um, but I also, I'm a mark for momentum. You know, I'm, I'm finding that as a, as a modern gamer now, like I like the excitement. I like the perpetual intensity. I like the momentum. I like the tension, yeah. but, and I like the combat, but I could also take a little bit of a page out of your book, Kyle, because I think with a game like this, you could create tension rather than dispel some of the tension by taking your time. You know, by having a rhythm like, all right, it's a slow point. Let me kind of grant yourself a build up, you know, rather than just like keep going. You know what I mean? Like, like I was saying, like channeling the colonial Marines and stuff like that. I'm always thinking of aliens. You know, I'm just like such a huge aliens number movie two fan that that's when I'm thinking sci fi horror. I just go there automatically, which I shouldn't because this is a culmination of so many brilliant things, you know? Yeah. So. There's a lot of 2001 in this too. I mean, we all know this is, you know, the marker is Dead Space's 2001's monolith, you know, stuff like that. So it's like, it looks cooler. It looks like a giant lobster claw, but there's a lot to savor here, not just the combat. But I think that's, that's sort of been the trend with me with games is like that. I said the same thing about the Uncharted series, which we just finished. It's like. That I enjoyed the combat. So Colin's like, Dagan, you got to start playing third person shooters. You know what I mean? Because that's what you seem to enjoy the most out of these things. Yeah, that's why we're going to get, we're gonna like get to that, Gears, you know? I think. I'll, yes. I'll, bring, I'll bring Dagan into Gears. I mean, I would that's love Dagan to play was. something like Kill Switch or something, but those games aren't even available anymore. So I think, I think at this point, you got to go to, because Kill Switch was fucking awesome. But you got to go to Gears, and Dagan's never played Vanquish, um, Vanquish, Vanquish is totally which is the just the absolute about. king. You know, like, oh, my God, Vanquish is fucking good. Oh, it's so <laughs> yeah. good. I think Vanquish and Gears might be my top two, honestly. Like, as far as, like, straight third-person shooters go. Yeah, I would throw, um, yeah, Gears, Gears 2, Gears 3, and then Kill Switch, um, and maybe Spec Ops The Line would be in there, too, yeah. which is a pretty mechanically sound game, but I just love that game overall, and that's a third-person shooter. Um, that story is great. Yeah, that's a wonderful game. We'll get to that on knockback as well. That's a that's a vital. Actually, I don't know how many people know this. Like when I was I I had a uh, an in process book deal with Harper Collins when I was at IGN in my early time at Kind of Funny, and I just walked away from it. It was just it was a very frustrating experience for me. Um, just being so harshly edited, I felt like I understand where they were coming from, but I'm like, you're not even letting me. Like, why don't you just write the book? Yeah, you know? where's your voice, um, right? And uh, so, but but I did a sample chapter on Spec Ops: The Line, and it's got a bunch of exclusive insight from um, Walt Williams, who's the who's the writer of the game, who went on to write a bunch of other stuff like uh, Star Wars stuff and whatever. And so, I have to find that material. That material might just be lost to history, unfortunately. I don't even know. But um, yeah, I have like so much inside information on that game because I was so obsessed with it. I was like totally obsessed with that game. It, it's a wonderful one. We'll get to that one on Knockback eventually, no doubt. All right, I want to go around the horn one more time with you guys and ask about some moments that you might want to talk about, uh, some moments that stand out to you. I wanted to call out two. The first is the um, the first time you meet the uh, fight a brute in that open area, that windowed area, that kind of almost like lobby-like area. That's a very memorable space from the first game for me, and I thought it was very um, lovingly recrafted. And that might be, as weird as it is, that's like my favorite space in the game because I, I always imagine people kind of, the hustle and bustle of that area when the ship was up and running. You go downstairs to the officers play part. There's like all the different ways to control different things on the ship. There's the elevator in the center, the door off to the side, the door to the left. And there's just a lot going on there. And so I always really loved that space. And I love that first fight with, uh, with the brute. But again, the pulse rifles, secondary fire makes the brute fights (laughs) fucking trivial. I mean, you just kinesis walk around them. Boom, boom, boom. Right in the back, and you just watch the, uh, and you just watch that or- orange item just pop out of them, you know, and <laughs> you just can go grab it. So it's not quite as scary as it was in the first one, but I wanted to give a shout out to that moment. And then another thing I really love is the USM Valor stuff. 
I think that that's super cool. The idea that there's this there's this like escape pod putting out a, or a distress signal that is just necromorph. The ship also gets the Ishimura's distress call. It picks up the distress pod en route. By the time it arrives at the Ishimura, it's already been taken over and fucked up by the necromorphs. It just crashes directly into the ship. And then you have to go onto the ship it's, to yeah. get the, the core. I think that's maybe the dopest part of the game. I think that's a, such a cool part of the game. So I wanted to point that out as well. Chris, what sticks out to you? What are some parts of the game that you that you liked? Oh, man, I think the brute fights are really cool. I, I think specifically the fact that or is it the brute? I can't. There's there is this, there's a specific reoccurring uh, fight that happens throughout the game. With it's this, the brute like, and the hunter. The, the hunter is the one you can't The kill. hunter. Yeah. I love the hunt. I love the hunter fights because it's there's something so unnerving knowing that you can only really slow it down. And the ways that the ways that the game lets you cleverly defeat it are really fucking cool like like luring it into the cryo pod and mm-hmm. and and then shooting its legs off so it's crawling and then stasising it so it's slow and then cool running shit. into the room and like freezing it and then like luring it behind the jet engine just to melt it into it's so like i love shit like that because it's and it, and it's it's part of dead space that gives it like there's like an immersive sim quality to it almost like not not fully. I wouldn't even I wouldn't call it an immersive sim, but just this idea of thinking about how you would use your natural surroundings in a way that would help you in this fight that feels insurmountable. And, you know, like maybe that'll work. And it does, you know, like it's 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 a really rewarding feeling to like figure that out for yourself. It's like, oh, this is a cryopod. This thing's unbeatable there's got to be a way to at least freeze it. And it's, it's, and the fact that it works and and you can do it and all of the tools that you have at your disposal naturally kind of lend, uh, lend the encounter to that outcome or just like, it's really smart. It's really smart design to make an encounter that is so clearly designed around one mechanic, but still have the player feel smart for figuring it out. It's like really, I don't know. It's like, a, it's a really thin, uh, thin line to walk and also just I think many of the zero G parts stick out to me just because again the memory of of how rough that used to be compared to how seamless it is now um, just really makes the game feel a lot better I think that first encounter in that room is amazing where you're running and and running away and, and you're separated by that barrier um, there's a lot of really I don't know like my mind's kind of reeling from like all of the from like all of it because I, I feel like so much of that 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 crash that ship crashing into the Ishimura part is is fucking awesome though like it is a really fucking and, and that's where the enemies come in where they can like teleport at you because they're like merged with their stasis ba- pa- pods or Dude. whatever the hell it's so Brilliant. cool it's just so many cool like everybody's everybody writing this and obviously this this is a testament to the original game generally um but they had so much fun finding every single creative way to make what is objectively a pretty slim and and fairly anemic enemy variety feel mm. really fresh constantly. Because there's really only like two enemies. Yeah, I would really. say it, I would say like even with with like what you would call palette swapping, which is not really what they're doing here. I mean, there's just, with just minor variations, I would say there's probably a half dozen real enemies in the game yeah yeah because there's like the the fat the fast weak one and the and the weaker slower one and the yeah yeah but they all all feels exactly the same they all read relatively the same but it's still like it it never feels samey like it doesn't it never like i never got the feeling that and and not to bash close the protocol because i did actually like like a decent amount of it me too but like it it actually you know despite the fact that i feel like you know there's there's still like a, a fairly small overall enemy variety in this game I, I didn't feel it at all in comparison to Callisto protocol which i actually felt a lot um so i just i don't know i think it's uh, dead space is awesome like it's so goddamn good yeah i totally agree and i like the yeah the moments you brought up the, the the hunter stuff is fun obviously loses its luster once you know what to do then it becomes so comical but i remember <laughs> being in those rooms for the first time or not really understanding the puzzle and you know you have to do something, and there is something almost Mister X like unsettling. This, this it's, thing will it's not scary. stop coming. It's, yeah, and, and and with a horror game, it's really all about your first time through it. You know, like I mean, it's um, it's not going to be as scary the second time. It's just the same thing with a comedy. It's not going to be as funny the second time you hear it. 
And so, you know, you have these this character that is like, I remember the first time it showed up, it had been so long since I played the original Dead Space, I totally forgot. I don't know. I'm terrified. Like, I, I, I cut the limbs off and I was like, okay, cool. And it just grows back and you're like, I'm stressed. <laughs> I am stressed. Well, I love that one space where you're reason. not, there's a part where you meet one where you're not able to do anything about it. In that, yeah. in that office space where the windows are crumbled and you're going in between like the outside and the hallway. And yeah. that's pretty, and you have to just be really fast around that. Very Resident Evil 2. In, it reminds in me, execution. it reminds me a lot of, um, and Daniel will get to this too, but uh, eventually, but uh, the Berserker in, in, in Gears 1 scared mm. the shit out of it, That scared the shit out of me when I was a kid. It was the most terrifying thing. I screamed and shut the game off for years. <laughs> um, but I was a wimp, I guess, around that time too. So, but yeah. Uh, Dustin, let's hear from you. What what are any moments stick out to you that you want to call out? I like the build up to the marker. You hear a lot about it. You hear about its effects. You wonder what it looks like, and then you finally see it. And it's this you know giant, horrifying. Uh, as Dagan said, the the crab or the the lobster claw that has all <laughs> this strange writing on it. But I think what really took it to uh, you know another level for me was how. When you get close to it, you can see it affecting Isaac. And I really yeah. like how it affects the HUD uh, and the and the text that pops up. There's parts where it's just like the alien language. And so that normally the the mechanics of how it's making you move it throughout the station. Normally, that's something I think that would annoy me. But because it was this crazy mythical object that is also making you crazy like you can't get too close to it. Maybe you're fighting somebody and you're like, oh, shit, I'm I'm standing right beside it. Yeah, That's the design of thing. that part feels very old. But yeah, you're right. Yeah. yeah, it's like I'm like just sitting here you <laughs> pressing buttons and just laughing and going ring, <laughs> right. turning it around. I'm like, what is this? But yeah. you're right. I love that, too. I, I actually pointed that out to Micah when I was playing. I was like, this is so neat. There's like an aura about it that is subtly built into the game, which mm -hmm. is which made it very frightening to me. Yeah, go on. Yeah. No, that's I that's pretty much it. Just uh, I like the freaky uh what's the word? Not Cthulhu, but that is the yeah, existential yeah, yeah, the, threat. The eldritch of kind of eldritch. nature of it. I do think um and that's actually like <laughs> that's actually a real way to that's actually proper use of that word. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah. um there is um I do want to give a shout out to two things in particular. Uh the pacing. I think, and I think this is just generally games of this time. Mm -hmm, I don't know what it is. I'm playing a lot of games from like 360 PS3 era, and they're paced so well, like like almost universally. Like every single game I've played from this era is just like perfectly paced. Doesn't overstay its welcome. Consistently introduces like new things to you at like a reasonable like even at the end like where you're doing that weird kind of like moving the marker through the 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 uh, what is it the 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 laboratory it's like a very old design for sure but like like uh like dustin said like the fact that it affects you in, in and it actually affects the enemies too in some weird way i noticed that like because like yeah. if they get too close if they get close to it, it it like there's something that goes on i couldn't exactly figure out what was going on but they were clearly being affected by it and i thought that was like really cool um and that was at the tail end of the game and i feel like a lot of games now like i don't know like i feel like they've run out of shit to show you by like the midpoint and then you still have like 20 hours left and it's like oh my god um, so I just kind of shout out the pacing and also just the way that they interconnected the Ishimura because in the original game, you know, when you get to the end of a chapter, you kind of fade in to this new, mm -hmm. like it's a level, it's based on levels. And so the fact that you can go and explore the entire Ishimura with like no loading or no visible loading is amazing. It like, it transforms the Ishimura into this place that I like, I remember being like kind of iconic to a place that I really understand the layout of and a, a place that I really spatially can figure out and i love that and, and the fact that you can move without without the tram from one space to the next to the next if you find the right doors if you get the right key cards if you clear the right obstacles it's just they did a just a completely amazing job with uh redesigning this ship in a way that is interconnected throughout the entire game with the exception of course with the end when you land on the planet but like there's always a point of no return in in games like this so yeah it's i don't know i i just really appreciated that from from somebody who remembers like the kind of 
I don't want to say disjointed nature of the original, but definitely less seamless nature in comparison to this. It's it's just really it blew my mind when I realized that you could activate the trams. Like that was like this is awesome. Yeah, it's it's super cool. So it's, cool. Even when you're using the save modules or the storefront, the game basically stays with you. Which I think, as I said earlier, it does a really good job of reinforcing the real time nature of the game. The game is happening on a minute to minute basis, and that's. That's true in a lot of survival horror, but not always. And it's not iterated yeah. in a lot of other games. I mean, a game like Fallout is is in real time until you sleep, you know, or until you craft something, but it only takes you one second or whatever the case might be. And so yeah, yeah. and everything and we always go into this JRPGs are just representations of time and space. So you're not really seeing anything to, as it really is in the world. So I like that. You're right. Dead Space does a really nice job of, of I think, grounding itself that that's a this chris i think is an example when people ask like what is the power of ps5 specifically or the power of next current gen consoles and i would add i would say that that is this is it is that it now we can render entire worlds with very background unintrusive loading so that you're never away from it you never have to read a screen again and you never have to be away from the game i love that and yeah. that is the power of PS5. That's that's a good example of why shit, man. Look, look at Hogwarts Legacy. I mean, we're ta- we're going to talk about it more on Sacred Symbols. They can't even get the goddamn game on PS4. I mean, they delayed it again. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, imagine getting this game on. It wouldn't even be possible. So that's why I love that these games are married to this new to these new consoles. They don't have yeah. to hold themselves back. It's a power. It's a, it's the sign of power even in a linear game like this. So yeah, that is super cool and a great point. Um, Dave, let's hear from you. Any any uh, parts any, any parts of the game you want to call out? Lo- just love the overall experience. I'll be heading back and and playing through again. It's definitely worth that. You know, I love the fighting and I love the fact that besides the combat, they give you so much to do. You know, so many memorable moments. I loved calibrating the anti asteroid cannons as we talked about. That was just an amazing sequence. And even things like bringing the centrifuge online or repairing the radar array or that one section where you have to do the kinetic throwing of the debris into the thrusters of the ship. Like oh, yeah, it, it, yeah. there's so many ways to tie you into the environment, tie you into the ship, kind of turn the Ishimura into a character and make it dangerous. You know, like that um, sequence where you first learn to use your stasis with the, um, the uh, pocket door that's sort of on the fritz and it's becoming like this two ton meat slicer you know and you have to use the stasis to get through it like everything is dangerous or just avoiding the centrifuge you know having to run from door to door so the centrifuge doesn't crush you to death and how vicious that is i just you know it was just so cool to interact with the environment and do it so smoothly and almost seamlessly you know and then just like besides the broader things just like the little details like kyle you were talking about the valor i love the little nuanced details like your the Ishimura, your Siri, you know, your on ship computer is a female voice. On the Valor, it's a male Siri, a male voice Siri. Like just having those little differences was really cool. And um, you know, Dustin brought this up earlier too, but the audio, you know, the sound design, not just the music, which sounds like, you know, any kind of sci-fi Ridley Scott, something that John Williams would create, just as good, the immersion, the mood the atmosphere the tension the dread and everything like that but the sound design the sound effects were i give it like a 99 percent. it was that good and you know where it culminated for me i loved how the sound was suppressed in the vacuum of space for those zero gravity sections of the game yeah where that was just a thoughtful touch too where it's you know the sound all but goes away it's just really nuanced and low and you know you could kind of feel it rather than hear it with the gunshots and the various enemy sounds and stuff. So, you know, just like soup to nuts, like just an amazing presentation. I was really kind of stymied to realize how quick they made this game, which was is fascinating because the quality is astounding. And, you know, just really enjoying it to my backlog is ridiculous. I can't go back to it now, but I definitely will be heading back to this game. It's worth it's worth a replay just to see, you know, kind of challenge myself on a higher difficulty level and just, you know, get the things that I'm sure I missed the first time through. Um, For me, I just wanted to, I mean, the only other things that I wanted to call out uh, that I thought were really high quality were, I, I thought the in-game economy is very well handled. Um, 
this is really important and hard to program and people are in charge of just making sure these things work about how many credits you get, how much things cost, how much access you have, how much healing you'll have. When you design and and when you didn't even have an in-game store, then you have to kind of ex- assume all of the game breaking that comes along with that. And it's a, it's a really important balance to um, to catch. And while I played, while my new game plus, I broke the shit out of the game. I played the first time pretty straight up um, and just broke it a few different times for basically just for money for nodes. Um, but I busted the game wide open the second time. And you can do that, and I'll explain to people again, and you can just read about it in more in more detail if you want to figure it out if they haven't patched it out yet. But you can basically use your pulse rifle at its secondary mine fire, shoot those out, pick them up, upgrade your pulse rifle at the bench. It re-equips it with the maximum ammo, then shoot them out, pick them up, then do that over and over again, then sell all the ammo. And that's like all free money, basically. And so if you figure those things out, you can do it, but not doing that, the economy worked very well. I love the, you know, and this is from the first game, the schematic system, how you have to find schematics, bring them back, then buy the things you need to build them. I think the yeah. node upgrade system is really fun, especially bringing it into new game plus new game plus plus, because I didn't upgrade all my nodes until the third playthrough, which was another reason why I was just playing it straight through. You need like 150 nodes or something. So it's, it's a ton of nodes yeah. that you need. And so you're going to eventually have to either find them over and over again, or you're going to have to just mine money, which is what I ultimately ended up doing. So I wanted to, I wanted to complement the economy and the upgrade systems. I thought that they were really well done. And just the way that the, the symphony, the symphony of all the different components, I thought made a lot of sense. Nothing felt out of place to me. Nothing felt too extra. Chris kind of already touched on it, but it's, it's, it's very finite and linear and limited. This game's length is the perfect length. It's replayability is the perfect replayability. It's price is the perfect price. It's production level is the perfect production level. I really feel like Dead Space Remake is a strong contender for game of the year. I mean, this is very early, right? But we'll be a recency bias is going to bury it probably. And there will probably be some great games that will make it seem maybe less that we would be blessed to get better games than this later in the year. But right. I mean, this game's got to be in that conversation. It was it was excellent. 100 percent. Yeah. And uh, I wanted to also part, we, we've taken the piss out of Motive a lot, the studio that made the game over at EA. They made Battlefront 2, which I think is dubious. It's single player campaign is is bad, I would say. Uh, Star Wars Squadrons is actually supposed to be pretty good, but I have not played it. But they uh, really showed us something here. And this gives me a lot of confidence, not only in the inevitable sequel that this game is going to garner, but also the Iron Man game they're making. It's this seems like they've come into a a new place, and I'm really excited to see what's up from them. And they're figuring it out. I think EA, we have this. At least I do. I mean, internally, I think I have a bias against EA sometimes in terms of their the way that they handle their internal studios and the way that those studios kind of deal with the work that they're supposed to do. And I think that that bias is sometimes unfair. And I think this is a good example of a studio that's just clearly getting better. And yeah, we have to give them their props for that. I mean, we've also just been around for a while and we we've seen the A uh, through many, many lenses over the years. I like I, I know for a fact that like I, I will never look at EA and not think of what they did the pandemic like never. It'll always it'll always be the first thing I think of. But I mean. Even just like there are parts of this game that I, that I play and I'm like. And I think about the prospect of some of this being moved over to an Iron Man game, and I think like this makes a ton of sense. Like that me, zero I'm, G shit plays wonderfully, and I can imagine. Yeah, I can imagine there's easy DNA there. I'm trying to find this. Mm. I don't know if I have it in here, but didn't EA just shut down one of their studios that they just bought like two years ago? It's just a mobile team. Oh, maybe. So like they're still doing it quietly. They're just not doing it to any of their big teams. It's it's the same reason why I think Bioware still exists. It's because I just don't right. think they think they can get away with it. They're too big. Right. Um, all right. Any closing comments? Uh, go around the horn one more time. Dustin, closing comments. Hmm. Closing comments. Uh, I guess just the next spoiler cast will be Hogwarts Legacy. So look forward to that with Ben and I. Maybe uh, I guess we'll see where we're going to work on scheduling that. But I was I was unsure because I didn't know how long it was going to be. But I just I looked it up. I'm on the last set of mission so we're almost cool. full steam ahead on that so look forward to that please please be excited yeah the, and we'll have more we'll do resident evil 4 for sure when that comes out 
Definitely and I was not. just talking to Dagan, actually, I'll just say it here um, is when the square when Square Enix releases Final Fantasy one, two, three, four, five and six, I would like to cover all of them. Um, I don't know what the venue would be for that. I think like the cadence of once a month and people can kind of come jump on or off as they as they want, culminating with six, which is obviously one of the great games of all time, although we'll have four in there, which is also one of the greatest games of all time. So um, we we'll have where I want to cover more games in more detail as we move forward. I'd like to get back to trails with Maddie, for instance. So there are a lot of things that we have to do. Oh, I don't know. Is anyone playing Wo Long? I don't think so. so I think Maddie played it. So oh, maybe Maddie. maybe they'll do it on Duke, but I don't know. Yeah, that would be cool. So anyway, um, thank you guys for playing along with uh, Dead Space Remake at home. I just slapped myself like pretty hard <laughs> when I was doing it. I didn't mean to do that so hard. But uh, thank you guys for your uh, your kindness in in waiting as well and kind of coming back to this game a little later. I appreciate that. We usually don't take so long with that. I, I like to give it a little space, but not not usually this much space. So we'll try to be better about that in the future. But um, we appreciate you both on Patreon and on free feeds. And we'll see you next time for more. Until then, goodbye. See Take ya. care. Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast, is a product and trademark of Last Stand Media and Collins Last Stand LLC and is proudly recorded in the USA. The show is conceived by, is written by, and is directed by me, Colin Moriarty. My co-hosts are Chris Raygun Maldonado and Dustin Furman. The show is produced by executive producer Dustin Furman. It's edited by associate producer Ben Smith. All of Last Stand's theme music is by my best friend, Ramon Narvaez. As you know, all of Last Stand's shows, including Sacred Symbols, are fan-funded on Patreon at patreon.com slash laststandmedia. The following names are at the producer level on Patreon, our highest tier, and we're grateful for your thoughtful and kind contributions to our independent endeavor. Thank you.